Hello friends, the Bourbon Nerd here. Welcome to lesson 16 in my Bourbon School. And today I will talk about bottle and bond and what that means. And today I'm sipping on actually a bottle and bond product called E.H. Taylor, single barrel, very nice product. A little bit difficult to get hold of, unfortunately, uh, but let's get right to it. Cheers, y'all. Hmm. Right. Hmm. Okay, so for the topic of today, obviously bottle and bond, and I'm referring to the fact like you can see on the labels here to the left of me, uh, sometimes it's this word bottle and bond, or maybe uh, just bonded on the on the label. What does that actually mean? So what I'll be covering today is that um, the formal definition of bottle and bond. I'll also explain why sort of that became a thing uh, back in the day. Um, and I'll also explain to you um, who the driving forces behind the bottle and bond movement was. And I'll also explain a little bit, you know, where bottle and bond is today. So that's basically the, the things I'll be covering. So uh, a short lesson this time, so um, hang in there. Cool. So this is actually the formal definition of bottle and bond. I will obviously not go through this slide. It's probably the most wordy slide that I've ever made in my life. Um, but one thing is that uh, this is a law that was passed on March 3rd, 1897. And that is actually celebrated by bourbon nerds everywhere, bourbon fans everywhere, because this is probably the most important date in American whiskey history. That's right, probably the most important uh, day. And, and you will know in, in a second why that is. So March 3rd uh, is Bottle and Bond Day. So what I've done here, I've made a summary of this uh, quite extensive legislation here. Well, I guess compared to today's legislation, it's not comprehensive, but back in the day, this was quite a thing here. So here are sort of my summary of the formal definition of Bottle and Bond. So to be able to write Bottle and Bond, on your whiskey, the whiskey must be as a minimum four years old. And uh, not only that, it has to be aged in um, sort of like a bonded warehouse. Um, um, and it must be under governmental supervision. Today, it's obviously sort of, sort of like a trust uh, system here, but back in the day, there were even situations where the distiller had one key and the gov government guy had one key to the warehouse. So there was very, very rigorous control, uh, hence the, the name bonded. That's actually what gave the name to bottle and bond. So the warehouse was sort of bonded with lock and key. And also this is a very special rule. It must be made by one distiller uh, in one distilling season at one distillery. So one distillery, so that, that makes sense, right? Uh, so it's just one individual. Uh, and at one distillery also makes sense. It's just one distillery. The distillery season, there are actually two distillery seasons. They're like January to June-ish, and then July to December-ish. And, and the, all the products that goes into the bottle and bond product must be coming from just one of the two seasons, distilling seasons that is, in one year. And then very important, uh, the product must be precisely 100 proof. So not more than 100 proof, but precisely 100 proof, which is 50% ABV. And then of course, uh, the whiskey cannot be sold if it's bottle and bond in barrels. Otherwise, it has to be sold in bottles. And I will explain in, in a couple of minutes why that last rule is also there. And when you have the bottles, it needs to have a seal around it. I mean, a little bit like the one you, you have here. Um, it must be unbroken, and that's all the governmental seal for this is a bottle in bond product. So these are the formal rules, and I will explain now why they made those rules uh, back in the day. Because remember, um, you probably remember from one of the first lessons, so we make whiskey, and it looks exactly like the one on the far left here, white dog, you know, completely white like water. And then you age it in a barrel and then it has this very nice flavor, uh, sorry, uh, color. And of course, very nice flavor as well. And everybody liked it. And as I probably talked about in lesson two or three, once people realized how much better uh, aged whiskey was, was compared to the white dog, everybody wanted it. And as you can imagine, what happens if supply is relatively low and demand is quite high because it takes years to get to this product, right? And suddenly uh, demand completely was like, like 10 times larger than supply here. Well, in today's economy, prices just go up, which they also did back then. But of course, back then also people started to cheat, started to cheat, to get whiskey, um, to look, appear, smell, and maybe even taste like it had been aged, even though it hadn't. 
And you must remember the way whiskey actually was sold back then. And we're now back in the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, something like that. Uh, it was actually mostly sold uh, where you get, get to either the saloon or the bar or um, at, at your local liquor supply. And they had all these, uh, this is of course a newer picture, but they had all these barrels on the wall and you basically uh, brought your own bottle or whatever it was uh, and they filled it up and uh, you basically paid for, for the whiskey of course so you were not really in control you know what happened from that barrel left the distillery until you actually got the whiskey in in the in the bottle right and remember people are starting cheating uh, and all these retailers uh, they actually call rectifiers they uh, were in on this game and speaking of these rectifiers here, um, and I know this picture here on the screen, or these pictures look really, really weird, but they came up with all kinds of weird things that they could put in the white dog, the newly uh, made whiskey, to make it again appear, smell, and sometimes even taste like whiskey. And I've taken some of the worst examples here on the screen. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, you know, acid they actually put that in uh, to make it have a little spark like 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 with high alcohol or aging they also um put in tobacco spit like you can see number two here in the case you wonder what that vase is under the tobacco speed it's actually something called a spittoon uh, spittoon i guess it's, it's pronounced uh, that you actually have in the whole saloons where you sort of uh, sp you you spat into to that spittoon with your tobacco um, after you used it so not very nice but uh, the tobacco tobacco speed actually had spit that had that's um, this color they really were looking for so so pretty bad and also prune juice can you imagine just put prune juice in it uh, to adjust the color and the taste a little bit and then the one closest to me and i'm not making this up they also took certain beetles they dried them and they pulverized them and put them back into the whiskey also because this was sort of indicating the the smell of oak and also it also tasted a little bit more like aging whiskey so all this uh, was actually added to the whiskey and and the list of stuff they put in is very very long but these are some of the more grotesque examples of what they actually put into it so what happened well you can imagine um the consumers really didn't like this so i have a um, sort of like a little bit of a comprehensive graph here and and i'll just before you read too much in it i'll also come with a, a couple of disclaimers here basically what this graph also indicates that once we got into those 1860s 1870s um consumer confidence in the whiskey because of all these things that the rectifiers that's what they were called put into the whiskey uh, it's sort of really uh, consumers consumers weren't really, really very nice uh, glad about this so uh, confidence uh, you know dropped and people were going to other things uh, like imported uh, spirits and also as you can see here beer of course in this graph you know there are multiple sources of what change here obviously the civil war was going on uh, uh, raging back then and, and as you can see there's a little bit of a, an uptake before the actual legislation uh, uh, in 1897 actually appeared but that is because the people that were advocating for this regulation bottle and bond regulation uh, they were quite active even before 1897 to restore the faith uh, and and sort of the reputation of of, uh, of whiskey here so that was actually the result and everybody can see it also the people in the government they could see um this is not going well you know we're losing confidence consumers are going away from whiskey which is something that we don't like you know they're drinking imported stuff and other stuff and we're losing taxation and all that so onto the scene onto the rescue actually came this guy and he's probably one of the most important people um in american whiskey history this is colonel edmund haynes taylor jr and i could have an entire lesson just on him alone because he's done so many things but the most important thing he did was to be sort of the father of the bottle in bond act which was uh, approved in 1897 and he's also the one that has given this name to the e.h taylor uh, product which is now owned by, by buffalo trace so um, he was the most important guy. So he uh, had distilleries and uh, he was the guy behind a group of people that finally um, convinced uh, the government to um, pass this act called the Bottle and Bond Act. And after this act was um, uh, approved, 
um, then you were sure as a consumer, um, you no longer went to uh, the saloon to get your bottle filled um, from, from, the, from the barrel. And you, if you went to the local liquor store, uh, you, you could be sure that if you actually picked up a bottle instead of bringing your own bottle and it had the seal on top of it and it was unbroken, you could be sure that the quality was good. It was a minimum four years old, had 100% proof, 100, 100 proof, um, and it was uh, under government su supervision. So of course you had to pay a little bit more for it, but at least you knew it was the good stuff. And that's how all this started. So very important. And it's probably the Ball and Bond Act is probably regarded as one of the first consumer protection acts in the world. And I find that uh, very nice as a whiskey geek here, that uh, one of the first consumer protection, protection um, rules uh, in the world was about whiskey. I think that's quite nice and also a little bit funny, but there you have it, that's in 1987. Okay. And actually bottled and bond today, I mean, uh, bottled and bond is really, um, you know, at the time of this video, 2022, it's, it's really in a boom uh, right now. So as you can see here, a lot of manufacturers are bringing out bottle and bond products. I believe there's probably a hundred products out there, maybe even more that are bottle and bond. Um, of course, it's not government supervision so much, um, so much anymore. I mean, it's probably gonna be a, a little bit of unannounced visits here and there, but it's not like they're lock and key and government are the only ones that have access to the warehouse, obviously for, for obvious reasons. But there is something that is quite strictly um, controlled and something that the manufacturers are adhering to uh, for, for sure. So you've probably seen some of these names, uh, pretty much all of the major manufacturers with a couple of exceptions uh, have ball and bond products. And I foresee this uh, trend upwards in the next few years, because it is actually also for the people today, even though it's, we, we don't drink, uh, you know, whiskey with, with beetles in it anymore, obviously, right? Um, but it is sort of like, if you go with a bottle and bond product, even though it's, it is relatively inexpensive price, you at least know that it has sort of like a minimum age and a minimum alcohol, alcohol strength and people actually have cared about it because they're following the rules. Okay, right. Um, and then I want to show you two strange ones. So maybe it is a little bit difficult to see here, but there is something wrong with these two labels here. So let's take the one at the far left. So um, this is a cast strength whiskey, which is a lot of them around, but it's also a bottle and bond product. And it is 130 proof. Now, didn't I just say that it had to be exactly 100 proof? So what is going on here, you think? Well, in this case, the people that made this whiskey didn't know the rules. So uh, this whiskey was made, was actually promoted as um, the world's first 130 proof bottle and bond product, if you can believe that. Maybe not by, by the manufacturers themselves, but you can still see screenshots out there a web shop that have sort of promoted this as the first 130 proof ball and bond product. So um, this label right there is illegal. And um, I will say in, a, in defense of these uh, people that made this whiskey, as soon as they were sort of informed that they had broken the rules, they actually um, uh, changed the label immediately. So if I do have a label of, of this one, a bottle of this one, I actually have one myself. Uh, it's sort of a little bit of a thing, you know, we, we can maybe uh, talk about in the future. So, so this, is some, this is a mistake made by the manufacturer. But that is not the case for this one that is just next to me. And this is, uh, you can see it's an older uh, label, it's from Jim Beam, and it is 86 proof. So that's not 100 proof, of course. So is this illegal? It is actually not because there's one exception that I didn't write on my summary there because it's not really relevant for the American market. Because if you do a ball and bond product and it is for exports, which this uh, label is, then you can go as low as 80, at least 86, but I think even as low as 80%. That is actually in the rules that were passed in 1897. So this one uh, is an export, uh, I believe into Germany um, uh, or Australia. Can't really remember where this is from, one of the two. Uh, and it's 86 and it says bottle and bond and is completely legal because it was not sold uh, on the American market, right? So there you have it, that was it. Pretty easy, bottle and bond for you. So it is literally uh, your 
um, insurance that, that the product has been minimum age four years, 100 proof, that's its export, um, and it is controlled uh, by one distillery uh, at one distilling season by one distiller, so qu quite rigorous, and of course with some kind of governmental supervision, so you will know that the quality is, is perfect or good. All right, that was all. Thank you for watching. Have a nice day. Cheers.